Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of module four, I think therefore I am. So it's looking at understanding our thought patterns and how they can influence children's experience of anxiety. Again, this is brought to you from Anoka Learning with Dr. David Coleman um, and the module on, sorry, the program on scared kids. So yesterday we took a look at black and white thinking, filtering information and mind reading. And today we're going to look at two more types of thinking and we're going to do an exercise on how to control our thoughts to help children control their thoughts. So firstly, the first thinking we're going to look at is catastrophizing. So this is the worst case scenario. So what can make catastrophizing difficult is often it is based on some evidence or an experience that was negative for the child. Again, because they are making assumptions, they will always assume the worst possible outcome. So from speaking with some of the teenagers I'm working with, um, their catastrophizing thoughts at this time during the, the virus crisis that we're going through, um, one of my teens was concerned about her nan and she's going to get the COVID-19 virus and she's definitely going to die. So from talking to her, she's convinced the virus might be on a tray delivered by Meals and Wheels or it could be on her post or it's going to be on her shopping bags and um, that are going to be dropped to the door. So when trying to challenge this catastrophizing that children fall into, we have to bring them back to see, well, what evidence supports the belief or the prediction? So there's a lot of supporting evidence in the news about older people dying. So I asked my um, my teenager, did they know the rate of recovery from the illness? Um, and the answer was, was no. So it was a possibility to maybe look at the rate of recovery. And then I asked her to look at the... Um, only people calling to the house and the fact that they were professional frontline workers. And I asked her to think about how effective and careful they are about hygiene. And um, then I asked her if her nan was following guidelines and washing her hands. And she assured me that she talks to her every day on the phone and that she is. So by doing this exercise, what we discovered was that the risk of her nan catching it is actually greatly reduced because all these measures are in place. So even though it doesn't take away the uncertainty of it happening, what it does do is it encourages my teenager to think a little bit more critically about the situation. So bringing in the upstairs parts of the brain that we talked about and it challenges the worst case scenario. So calming the downstairs part of the brain that's sending the signals to say there's danger. So again, it's not just children or adolescents that fall into to these thinkings. And you're probably starting to recognize that we think like this ourselves as adults. So the next thinking we're looking at is emotional reasoning, and this is a particular kind of thinking style. So the upstairs part of our brain has two sides. We have the right side, which deals with creativity and emotions, and the left side is our logical kind of reasoning side. So in emotional reasoning, the right part is more superior. It's in control. And the left side, the reasoning part and the logic part, isn't as connected to what's happening on the right side. So a child who feels these really strong feelings might confuse the facts with the feeling that they have. So whenever the emotion, whatever emotional state that they are in will dictate how they're going to understand what's going on in their circumstances. So then they believe that whatever the feeling that they have is that, that re represents the truth for them. So let's go back to my adolescent and say that she's thinking like this. So she presented as panicked, overwhelmed and helpless and convinced herself that her nan was going to contract the virus and die. This was her truth at the time. So to challenge this in the emotional reasoning thinking, we have to begin to integrate the two sides of the brain. And that might mean getting the, the child or the adolescent to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and replay the experience. So I asked my adolescents if I presented to her as or if I presented to her as maybe another adolescent that she knows with all of these big feelings, how would she perceive the, the information or the situation and talk to me? So what this does, it allows them to remove themselves from their feeling space and actually begin to think about their situation more logically. So it can sometimes be difficult to challenge emotional reasoning simply because we don't want to always um, get children to think in a logic way. And um, sometimes we do want them to rely on the gut feelings because this is sometimes a signal from the brain responding to something dangerous and they may need to act on it. So really it's about finding the balance. We don't want them to be able to experience, we do want them to be able to experience the emotions, but 
sometimes it will be appropriate for them to bring in some logical thinking to allow them to connect the left and right side of the brain. So the upstairs part of the brain to the downstairs part of the brain. So one of the difficulties in talking to children about their thinking in relation to anxiety is they will sometimes believe that they just can't help it or it's just the way they mind, their mind is. So they don't have any sense of having control over the thinking. So if they um, believe that they have no control over their thoughts, then they believe that they can't influence in them anyway. It's out of their control. So and here we're, we're trying to get the child to begin to influence their own kind of thinking style. So David Coleman uses a fabulous technique. So it's an exercise that he gets children to do that actually gives them a much stronger sense of the ability to be able to be in charge of their thinking. So I'd like you to try it with me now and it'll help you have a better understanding and then maybe you could apply it to your own child. So I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you to think of a pink elephant. So a big pink floppy ears, his big pink trunk, and a long pink tail. Now imagine it has big pink legs plodding boom, boom, boom through big fields. Now imagine the elephant is really close. You can really see this big pink elephant. And it takes a big suck of water out of a close by river and then whoosh, it sprays the water all over you. So have you a good strong image of the big pink elephant? So hopefully by now your child will have this image as well. So I'd like you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to focus on something else. Not a big pink elephant. So it can be anything you wish. So maybe don't think of an animal because that will probably lead you back to the pink elephant and actually don't think of anything pink at all. Because thinking of something pink is going to remind you of the pink elephant. So the aim of this exercise is to not think of a big elephant. So hopefully now you're thinking of something other than a pink elephant or even the color pink. OK, so we break the exercise here. And at this point, you might ask the child or yourself what they think of. And how easy was it to think about it? So think of what you just experienced during that exercise. How easy was it to focus on your new object when I kept referring to a pink elephant? That was distracting. And the image of the big pink elephant was constantly coming into your mind. So Dr. Coleman uses this analogy for the child to say it's really difficult then if somebody says don't be anxious, we're still going to be focused on anxiety. Or saying to a child there's nothing to be afraid of in school, we're still worried about going into school. So it's very difficult to shift your thinking if people keep bringing you back to something that you are actually trying not to think about at all. So just as I did in that exercise. So the next part of Dr. Coleman te techniques, he will ask the child to do a new exercise. So for this part, we're going to focus on something completely different. So again, I'd ask you to close your eyes. Now, this time I want you to imagine a golden dragon, a dragon like ones you've seen in the movies. So it's kind of long and thin with a long tail, but it has beautiful golden stretched out wings. So just imagine the big golden wings stretching out and lovely golden scales that sparkle in the sun. So imagine now that the dragon is taking flight up into the sky, whooshing around, flying over a beautiful magical castle. The people in the castle know this is the dragon that protects them and keeps them safe because he is just so beautiful and golden. He flies around the castle, protecting people all day, the sun bouncing off these golden scales. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, he shoots flames out of his mouth and soars up into the sky near the sun. So if I had to ask you now, over the last few, few seconds, did you think about a pink elephant? Now, the chances are you haven't and that you've managed to focus your attention entirely on my description of the golden dragon. So hopefully what this will do for you and for your child is to be able to explain to them that when we deliberately shift your focus of attention and think about something different, it is possible to move away from something that we are thinking about. So you moved away from the pink elephant and you found and focused the golden dragon. So for the child, the pink elephant can represent a negative thought and the golden dragon representing a positive thought. So telling them to not have the negative thought, chances are they will still have them. 
However, we can replace the negative thought with a positive thought. So replacing the pink elephant with the golden dragon, suddenly you're not focused on the negative anymore. So Dr. Coleman suggests that this technique gives the child an awful lot of power to be able to shift their focus of attention away from negative and hopefully onto something positive. And this is a way we can give children the capacity to be, capacity to be in charge of their own thinking. So this brings us to look at how strong, strongly visualizing something can have um, on our thinking. So we've learned that when we create really strong, powerful visual images in our head, it really does allow us to move our thinking away from anything else and focus it on whatever it is we're trying to focus on. And so Dr. Coleman recommends using that technique as a much broader relaxation technique for children and give them a way to, to give them a way to take a break from their anxious thinking. So he does a lovely visualization technique to allow children move away from the negative thinking and into this beautiful visualization. Um, and he calls it their safe space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record it as a mindfulness piece um, for you to be able to listen to and then maybe get your child to listen to. And I'll link it up um, with this um, with this video in the next couple of days. So thanks for listening. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.